Thank you. Um, glad to be here and, and happy to be talking about um, the things that happened at the California Earthquake Clearinghouse during the Ridgecrest earthquakes in July. The uh, California Geological Survey, um, after a major or damaging earthquake, um, is it's in our statute, it is authorized to establish an earthquake clearinghouse. And we work in partnership with our, our co-managing partners, our Earthquake Engineering Institute, ERI, which we just heard from, the United States Geological Survey, the USGS, uh, the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, and the California Seismic Safety Commission. So as a team, we we take on the uh, the, the establishment of, of getting a, a clearinghouse up and going. As Maggie and uh, Matt have talked about, the clearinghouse provides for the timely sharing of information and data by researchers and engineers and scientists conducting reconnaissance immediately after an earthquake, um, mostly to collect that, that perishable information that is so important. The California Earthquake Clearinghouse can be activated for kind of on you know three different levels. If it's an urban area struck by major and or damaging earthquake, we take that into consideration or upon recommendation of any of our ma managing, managing partners uh, when the uh, damage is significant um, or in a de densely, less densely populated area with an earthquake large enough to damage structures and lifelines. And when uh, the 6.4 hit, it, you know, some of that was kind of marginal. So during the course of the day on, on July 4th, we were sort of processing the information that was coming into the State Operations Center. The physical earthquake clearinghouse, as you've heard, is basically where your scientists and engineers and other professionals become part of a larger temporary organization whose primary purpose is to collect and disseminate that perishable field data. It provides a daily forum where geologists and engineers and other practitioners can, can assemble to share and discuss ob observations and, and coordinate field investigations. Just a, a quick overview of the Ridgecrest earthquakes um, on July 4th, this year, uh, Southern California experienced a magnitude 6.4 earthquake. And I say Southern California because it was felt pretty wide. It was felt all the way over to Las Vegas and 114 miles to the southwest in Los Angeles, very weakly, but it did attract a lot of attention. Uh, and it was followed by many aftershocks. Within minutes uh, on social media, there were initial reports of damage and fires. When um, that earthquake hit, I was uh, 90 miles to the north in the little town of Independence watching a parade. We did not feel it. Uh, we were standing there on Highway 395, but I did get a call from my son in, in, in uh, LA and said, hey, I just felt an earthquake. And then I also heard people milling around starting to talk about that 15 miles to the south in the town of Lone Pine, people had felt it. So I began to realize this is probably a larger regional event and began to, to look at my phone and collect some more information on what had happened. The epicenters, uh, on the map in the middle there, you can see Ridgecrest down in the in the lower left, uh, or lower right, lower, lower left, excuse me, Trona in the upper left, upper, upper right, I'm getting my directions mixed up. And the, the gray area, the beige area, is the China Lake Naval Ep, uh, Weapons Center, and that area is restricted. So you can see where the first epicenter, the 6.4 is the lower one, the magnitude 6.4 was in the base and it, it caused significant rupture uh, both in the base and off the base. And then the later earthquake, which I'll talk about, the 7.1, uh, ruptured all the way through uh, north, north, uh, west, and southeast uh, through the base and, and further off the base to the southwest. Based on ground motion and, and initial reports damage, uh, the, the acting state geologist and the Cal OES Earthquake Program Manager at, were, at, were stationed at the uh, State Operations Center and they agreed that between the two of them that they realized that there had been a threshold that would meet the activating of the clearinghouse. So the clearinghouse members were notified and information went out. Cal OES was able to establish quickly a clearinghouse location uh, via the Ridgecrest Police Department, an area that could hold up to 50 people uh, for our evening briefings and have obviously electricity and, and uh, internet connections. Mapping on the base, uh, as I mentioned before, was restricted, but on July 4th, uh, chief scientist uh, with the USGS, Ken Hudnut, <laughs> sorry, Ken, blanked on your name, and Janice Hernandez with, this, with CGS reached out very quickly uh, to see about uh, getting permission to go onto the base, escorted onto the base, so they could start looking to see uh, uh, what was going on out there. So on July 4th, uh, that action took place very, very quickly. So we, we had a place to, to set up. So on July 5th, I drove down uh, to Ridgecrest 
And uh, as I was driving into town, I noticed that most of the res residential homes looked in good shape. Uh, arrived at City Hall, it looked like it was in good shape and was able to set up the clearinghouse room. As Maggie mentioned, we had a briefing that evening. Uh, we started the call and about 16 minutes into the briefing, the, the eight of us, uh, USGS and CGS geologists, all had to drop cover and hold on and go under the table. Uh, we came back out, it, you know, it, it shook, it up, shook us up shook us pretty good, but uh, we unmuted our phone and said, hey, we're all back in order here. Uh, three minutes after that, the 7.1 hit and we dropped covered and held on again and really did have to hold on as we were really slung side by side. Eventually the power went out uh, and when the shaking died down, we, we exited the building. Uh, the power eventually came back on, but we continued the uh, our first briefing in the parking lot there at Ridgecrest. Uh, no damage, uh, 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 was done to the building that we were in, we were able to return to it again uh, the next day. But it was a great kickoff uh, to uh, start the uh, the clearinghouse off. If you look at the map, just what I want to point out that the the extent of rupture when you combine the the rupture area of both uh, uh, earthquakes was about 31 miles across from from the northwest to the southeast and about 11 miles uh, from the southwest to the northeast. And so it's quite a big area. It, that had been um, identified. This map that you're looking at came out about four days after the 7.1. So it was one of our first uh, public facing maps that we were able to release. It shows uh, the extent of mapping that was done by the USGS, CGS, uh, University of Nevada, Reno, USC, and uh, uh, UC Fullerton, as well as uh, uh, use, utilizing the JPL ARIA uh, satellite imagery looking at uh, potential areas where the ground had been deformed and that was a great tool throughout this event to help guide uh, scientists out there to keep uh, looking for and validating the complexity of the ground rupture. So the California Earthquake Clearinghouse, our, our basic operations support, um, ERI uh, was, was basically our, our, our greatest, you know, partner there, op, you know, working with operations, communications, leading the briefings, keeping the virtual clearinghouse up to date, and a lot of other activities as well. CGS was, was involved with that too, assisting ERI, uh, and was very involved with data collection and database management. USGS also contributed at the clearinghouse staff uh, remotely uh, with the data collection and database management. The Seismic Safety Commission also uh, had a staff person there that helped us with operations. Cal OES was, was located, all the Cal OES staff was located at the State Operations Center which in Sacramento, which offered a great opportunity to be able to have direct communications with the state's emergency operations. You know, part of what you've already heard before that the clearinghouse investigations are important for defining and documenting perishable information. Uh, these are some examples of, of what was seen and discovered out there. We, we our scientists and engineers looked at surface rupture, liquefaction, lateral spreading, uh, ground shaking. The uh, picture on the uh, upper left shows kind of the distributed faulting uh, throughout the region. The orange is the known fault zone, which, which did not rupture in the red and the blue, uh, signifies the new faulting that occurred from, from this sequence of earthquakes. As you look slightly to the left, where you see the, the small uh, aerial photograph with detailed pink lines. This is one of the very detailed studies uh, done by uh, one of the teams out there. It consisted of structural engineers as well as engineering geologists looking at you know, a very detailed slice of what the deformation is in detail going across the strand of the fault. Further to the left, up in the upper left, you can see some of the lateral spreading that was in Trona. The whole town uh, from the uh, uh, minerals plant down to the Dry Lake shoreline uh, had experienced, a, or portion of the town experienced lateral spreading due to liquefaction. Down in the lower uh, left-hand corner, you can see some of the rupture. One thing that was interesting about this fault is there were stepovers and splays of faults uh, across the desert coming off of these, uh, the major, major rupture areas. The maximum amount of vertical offset was kind of interesting. It was it was approximately around 12 feet, and it was in the areas where some of these stepovers were occurring. So blocks uh, of earth were sort of porpoising up where the fault was stepping over. The maximum uh, strike slip, the, the uh, horizontal separation, was around 15 feet. And you can see in that uh, right-hand picture, uh, two people sitting on either sides of a 
It was look, it looked like a, a, a storm flood, uh, an ephemeral event that it had left a nice marker, and that was where the 15 feet was vertical horizontal offset was measured. And you can see how an event like that uh, could could that marking could be washed out in the next rainstorm, the next windstorm. So getting out there and collecting this perishable information was very important. Information on the effects of the building environment, as, as we've already heard about, is very, very important uh, in, in Trona and Bridgecrest. The, the gas, power, communication, bridges, water, transportation, everything was, was looked at. Structurally, uh, the general building stock was evaluated. There was one hospital that was looked at. Uh, commercial structures, single family homes, manufactured homes did not do, do so well. Uh, there were fires. Uh, school was out on the 4th. And with the damage, uh, I think pretty sure that no one went back to the school on the fifth, so no one was in there for the for the second earthquake. Ground motion uh, was compared to the damage, and um, although we didn't do the building tagging, we was concerned that we didn't see building tagging going on, and um, expressed that concern to others. The picture there in the lower left, you can see uh, the theater that uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, Fred Turner from the Seismic Safety Commission had realized that even though on the outside it didn't look so bad, uh, getting permission to go inside uh, briefly to see, you could see that there was much more damage going on in the inside. Chimneys uh, were, were were studied uh, as well as mobile homes and to determine you know what was causing some mobile homes to 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 fall off their foundations, whereas others didn't. Uh, there was a water pipeline that was broken and a gas pipeline that was broken too that were were looked at extensively. So the benefits of having the Ridge Crest Crest clearing, physical clearinghouse, you know, it provided rapid assessment of the geologic hazard and documentation of perishable scientific information that's going to be used both by the scientific and engineering community uh, for the improvement of building codes and 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 for research in general. Uh, a lot of the information was used that's going to help modeling uh, what potential damage could happen, as well as modeling uh, the types of deformation across these zones. We had improved coordination of, of teams and individual, individuals in the field. The, the coordination, a lot of the coordination had to take place because we only had permission to let people who had government IDs onto the base and those teams had to be organized in advance. So the clearinghouse provided that opportunity to, to bring in other members as needed. When, when the earthquake first happened, we thought that the base was only gonna be open to scientists for a few days, uh, shutting down on the Sunday after the Friday of the second earthquake, but that uh, ended up being extended for quite a bit amount of time. The clearinghouse also helps with coordination and communication um, uh, to into the restricted areas, which I had already talked about. The Clearinghouse helps link scientific and engineering communities with agencies and organizations responsible for emergency response. So via our evening briefings, information that's posted to the Clearinghouse, direct communication with the State Emergency Operations Center, we're able to, to disseminate the information that's coming in daily to the Earthquake Clearinghouse. Uh, we provide expertise, important for potentially directing response resources, uh, personnel equipment supplies. So if Cal OES or other levels of emergency management are looking at where they need to go in addition to where they already have identified, we can provide additional information that other areas that might need assistance, such as areas that have been impacted but were not recognized yet. The evening briefings provided a forum for mapping groups, as we mentioned, to report out their findings. These briefings included columns from other field personnel that who couldn't make it back, other invited agencies, representatives from the California, from the state uh, operations center in Sacramento. Data collection apps were used to facilitate site, uh, systematic gathering, documentation, dissemination of data, observations, and finding. The Clearinghouse provided on-site support for accessing uh, uh, some of these data collection apps. The virtual Clearinghouse had many benefits. Uh, the sharing of field data, as, as we've mentioned, uh, access to upload and, and share photos. It hosted links to other data and other imagery uh, coming in, uh, posted preliminary reports and virtual reconnaissance reports from those who were working out of the clearinghouse and continued updates after the physical clearinghouse was closed. 
online information. I thought this was a great page. If you just were brand new and you weren't sure what to do, but you're a geologist or an engineer and wanted to get involved, you could come to this page and actually it would give you uh, a pathway to be involved. Uh, the online information was explained how you could share information if you're coming out and how you could coordinate with others. It could it explain some of the apps that we were using. It showed you how to upload fo photos as you had already heard about and uh, it just how to who to connect with. Maggie had her email there. If, if you're looking at how to connect, you could actually just con contact us directly. Uh, the Clearinghouse communicated with emergency management officials in a variety of ways. Um, our most direct communication was with uh, Leeds, lead uh, state geologist uh, at the who was stationed at the, the State Emergency Operations Center along with the Cal OES uh, other management team members. Um, from early on, the, the State Operations Center was able to locate a physical clearinghouse. Uh, early on, the State Operations Center was able to find the contacts for uh, arranging helicopter flyover support for fault rupture uh, onto the base. And uh, through the State Operations Center, we were able to, to initiate communications with regional county and city EOCs. The clearinghouse evening briefings um, were broadcast and uh, emergency management officials were uh, you know, invited to, to, to listen to those as well, to be up to date as what was going on, uh, and included off-site representatives from ERI, USGS, Seismic Safety Commission, Cal OES, USGS, FEMA, Region 9, the Southern California Earthquake Center, JPL, and, and others. Clearinghouse members uh, you know, coordinated, uh, uh, were able to coordinate their own direct contacts with local officials. An example of that was the USGS and CGS lead scientists met early on, as I mentioned before, to establish contact and coordination with the, the Navy to get onto the, the Naval base. Um, they also met with the city of Ridgecrest and, and the mayor um, very, very early on on July 4th. Uh, the Seismic Safety Commission structural engineers met with the Ridgecrest Building Department directly. Uh, Ken Hudnut, lead scientist with USGS, had an opportunity to, along with Cal OES and FEMA to meet with the vice president who happened to be in town. And what was great about the clearinghouse is that those evening briefings allowed the, all those particular conversations and those connections to be uh, shared back with others. So everybody was aware what, of what everybody was doing. Maggie already talked about this, but the uh, uh, once again, the, the the virtual website had a lot of resources for emergency managers, and, and I'll just go past that for the sake of time. Examples of some of the data available data resources posted on the clearinghouse included imagery. Uh, we had the uh, imagery from NASA connected, UNAVCO connected. Uh, we had uh, early on, we had some information from FEMA, the, the declaration and, and other helpful uh, posts for people who are looking for possible assistance. Uh, we can we very early on we had early reports coming in from teams who were working out there so we had structural recon virtual recon which is something new to me that i thought was awesome we had people who were not even at the clearinghouse putting together virtual reconnaissance reports and other rapid assessment reports everything was put up there as soon as it became available so what lessons were learned during the implementation of the ridgecrest earthquake clearinghouse well right off the top i can tell you that i took on um I was invited to 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 be the chair of the earthquake clearinghouse four months before the earthquake hit, so uh, it was pretty green. I had, I had read a lot and had met the team, but um, I hit the ground running, and and everything for me was an opportunity to learn more and learn about what everybody else was doing. Uh, just want to point out that lessons learned from the Napa earthquake led to a team of, of CGS geologists and GIS staff to develop a, a digital field uh, data collection system for fault rupture, landslide, and liquefaction. And this went really well, uh, along with USGS, CGS, and other people who were mapping out on the base were able to uh, uh, create a very robust uh, data database of the damage out there. The only glitch we had in this for this particular earthquake is the the naval base, uh, the military, because of sensitivity of features out there, uh, had to hold back on the release of the data. Uh, well, and they're still st still screening it uh, for any images and uh, that could could make them vulnerable. So we're we're hopeful that that information will be coming out soon once they're finished their screening. Some of the high points of things where we could we've learned where we might be able to improve more is to strengthen our communication with state level regional coordinators and local EOCs. Uh, maintain an updated contact list for clearinghouse activation notifications. For long activations, those of us working in the clearinghouse, we recognize that we would need additional staff and probably have at least two overlapping shifts to, to be more effective of getting some of the information prepared for the next day uh, out to, to others. 
we've talked about a need for just a daily summary. Even though our, our, our briefings go out, the, the notes from the briefings are still kept pretty close because it's pretty raw information, but we realized that we would like to create a summary, an online dashboard uh, each day, uh, kind of highlighting what has been done and, 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 and what is currently going on to help provide that information out to the, to the public and emergency managers at, at large. Continued outreach to science and engineering and social science professionals to be involved. Uh, we had some people show up, say, hey, I, I, we, we're new to this. We, you know, what, do you, what would you like us to do? And so we realized there's a lot of uh, professionalism, a lot of science, a lot of understanding out there that could be brought in by uh, uh, geotechnical engineers, uh, uh, engineering geologists, social scientists that we would like to have on board. And, and we're gonna be working towards educating uh, more people with workshops with that regard. And lastly, the need to review and update our, Calif our California Earthquake Clearinghouse Operational Plan. When I came aboard, our, our current plan that we have is, was done in 2009, and uh, definitely we, we, we all agree we need to, to look through that thoroughly, especially after being through Ridgecrest, to build in scalability for a large magnitude event with a multi-city, multi-county urban area, which we know we can have in California. And that wraps it up. And once again, my, my email information is up there too, and, and I'm Doubtful we're going to have time for questions, but please feel free to email me any questions if you have it. Thank you very much.